you know my love for Spurgeon, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great English pastor. He led the singing every Sunday. So I was just trying to be a little Spurgeon-esque this morning, if possible. I thought that'd be funnier than it was. But anyway, <laughs> take your Bibles and turn with me to Romans chapter 8. As we continue our study, our discussion of union with Christ. And today we're going to talk about union with Christ and prayer. Now, for months now, we've looked at union with Christ. We've looked at, hopefully, every possible dimension that we could find. But then we've come to chapter 8 of Romans because that whole chapter is focusing in on what it means to be in union with Christ. And understand, it, it, it's, its capstone is the very first verse. I mean, when Paul makes that statement in, in chapter 8, verse 1, and he says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He says, that's it, folks. And now I'm going to explain what that means in daily Christian life, in daily Christian walk with Christ. What it means to be in union with Christ is that your sins are forgiven. You have been justified. Paul dealt with in chapter 5 and chapter 3 of this same book. And he, he talked about the whole concept of justification. You have been declared by God not guilty. Doesn't mean you're, you're guilt, not guilty until you sin again. Doesn't mean you're not guilty until you mess up. If that's the case, we're all lost. I was reading something by Spurgeon again this week, and he said, he said, you know, if you can lose your salvation, you will. Quite simply, if you can lose it, you will. We all will. Because we all have unconfessed sins. We all have struggles in life that we don't go before the Lord with as we should. And, and so if you can lose it, you will, every one of us. And if you can lose it because there's an unconfessed sin in your life, understand this, none of us will be in heaven because we have sins that we haven't confessed. We have sins that we don't even know we have. And that's problematic if Romans 8 verse 1 is not true. But I just want to tell you, Romans 8 verse 1 is true. There is therefore now no condemnation, none, zilch, zero, for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then he, then he fleshes it out. He talks about how if you're in union with Christ, the Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit. You're a son of God. You're adopted in the family. You no longer have a spirit of slavery, but you've got a spirit of adoption. You, you sense that. You know that. You've been brought into the family and the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, just confirms that to you, that you belong to him. And he talks about how there's a lot of suffering involved in this, and suffering will be a part of it, and you've got to recognize that. The, the Christian life is not a life of ease. It's not a life of, of a bed of roses. The Christian life will entail suffering, and that suffering will lead to glory, and that glory will lead to restoration of all things, where even this body that is frail and, and broken and, and sick and, and weak will one day be restored into a glorified body in the presence of Christ, and all of that will be gone. There will be, there'll be not only suffering in this life, but there will be the glory of Christ, and there will be an absolute restoration in the presence of Christ to all things as they ought to be, as they were in the garden. I mean, I mean, Paul in this is saying, if you're in union with Christ, you need to be shouting. <laughs> you need to be happy, gloriously filled with joy. And that doesn't mean in the middle of suffering, you say, oh man, this is great, I'm suffering. No, that's not what he's talking about. We hurt during suffering. We, we agonize during suffering. And that's what, I think that's what Paul is dealing with in, in verses 26 and 27. When he talks about prayer. Now he's already talked about prayer a little bit. You know, when he, when he talks about it in verse 15, he says, you know, we've received, not received a spirit of slavery, but a, uh, leading to fear again, but we received a spirit of adoption by which we cry out, this is prayer, crying out, Abba, Father, with an intimacy and a, a knowledge of him. I, I think Paul is saying there, we're talking about prayer there, but it's a prayer that just says, Lord, you are my Lord. Lord Father, you are my Father. In a very intimate, very real sort of way. But, but then in verse 26 and 27, verses 26 and 27, it's not quite as exciting as crying out, Abba, Father. In fact, it's kind of painful, kind of hard. 
he says in verse 26, he said, in the same way, and that's a transitionary statement, in the same way what? Well, in the same way we have hope, verse 25, in the same way that we have hope for what we do not see and we persevere, waiting eagerly for it, in the same way we have hope, in the same way Christ is with us in the middle of sufferings, in the same way as all this, God, Christ is intimately involved in our prayer life. In the same way, the Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, third person of the Godhead, also helps our weakness. He helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Paul says, I want you to understand this. In the midst of your suffering, in the midst of your looking in hope to that which has been promised and that which will not disappoint. He said, I want you to understand something, that, that the Christian life and the prayer life of the Christian is not something that's easy all the time. And now sometimes, you know, it, it's easy to pray. Sometimes things are going well and, and everything's going your way and you can sit down and say, God, I thank you for giving me this. I thank you for giving me that. I thank you for doing this. And, and we get all excited about it. But there are times when it is hard to pray. If you're here Wednesday night, you heard me mention two dear friends of ours in Maryland, Jace and Jacquelinette Broadhurst. Uh, Jace is a pastor of Poolsville Baptist Church in Poolsville, Maryland. And and. As he's there pastoring, and he's, 40, he's 44 years old, his wife's 42 years old. Uh, a few weeks, or three years ago, she was diagnosed with breast cancer before she was 40. And, and, and then they treated it, it went away, it went into remission. They were all happy and good until about three weeks ago when it came back with a vengeance in her lungs, in her liver, in her pancreas, in her bones, in her spine. It's about everywhere. 42 years old. Three precious little boys. And, and I listened to a sermon that Jace preached a few weeks ago, uh, last week. He preached it last Sunday. I listened to it last Monday morning. And, and it was from Psalm 88. If you've ever read Psalm 88, Psalm 88 is not the psalm you go to when you want to feel better. Psalm 88 is filled with darkness. It says, darkness is my only friend in that psalm. The psalmist is is crying out at a time when he's suffering. But that's in the inspired Word of God, in the inspired hymn book, if you will, for Israel and for you and me to listen to and hear and to know. So it's, it, it's important to know it. But he started out by saying, you know, we all know the truth that, that the Bible promises us that God never puts on us more than we can bear. You ever heard that? Could anybody real quickly turn to, in the Bible and find it for me and shout it out? Don't try. You'll be looking the rest of your life. It's not there. The Bible doesn't say God's never going to put on you more than you can handle. Now, he does say to the Corinthians, God's, when you're in temptation, God is not going to allow you to be tempted beyond that which you can avoid, and he will give you a way out in temptation. But he's not talking about not putting on you more than you can bear. Listen, there's some people sitting in this room right now that have owned them more than they in their own strength can bear. No, the whole idea is that when we're in struggles and when we're in suffering and when there's pain there and we need to cry out to God, that we understand we can't bear this, Lord. We need for you to bear it in our place. That's the whole issue of sin, isn't it? You can't bear your own sin you bear your own sin it leads to hell if you, if you try to bear your own sin it, it just means that that you have no hope because you cannot compensate for you cannot you cannot atone for you cannot do enough to balance out sin in your life scripture is obvious with that and so jesus came he came and he bore your sin if you're a believer if you're in christ if Romans 8.1 is speaking about you being in union with Christ, no condemnation, Jesus took that which you could not bear, and he bore it on himself. 
on the cross. So that he might give you back, not sin to have to deal with, but that he might give you back and impute to you his righteousness, making you righteous in the presence of a holy God, you who still struggle with sin. So that which you could not do for yourself, that which you had on you, that you was more than you could bear, God dealt with it through the death of his son. Paul is saying here in verses 26 and 27 that there are going to be times in your life There are going to be times when you don't know how to pray. But I want you to understand, he says, that the Holy Spirit, Christ's presence in your life through union with him, helps in our weaknesses. Now, the word help there is a word that, it's a compound word. It has several things built in. But the very root of it is the same word that Jesus used in the Gospel of John, the Greek word paraclete, which which literally means a helper, or one who will come alongside and lift you up. The word here, as it's compounded, literally means one who will strengthen you and lift you up and hold you up when all you feel like doing is falling down. When all you feel like doing is giving up. When you, when you go to your knees to pray and you're in the midst of struggle and stress and suffering and you just don't know what to say. You've said it all. Oh, you've asked for for forgiveness. You've asked for strengthening. You've you've asked, if you're ill, you've asked for a healing that doesn't seem to be coming. And and you've said everything possible to say. You don't know what to say. About all you can do is groan. About all you can do is mumble. You, You sound like a one-year-old baby who can get out no more than blah, 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 blah. I mean, it's just nothing. You don't know what to do. You don't know what to say. You don't know how to react. You don't know how to, you just don't know what to do. Paul says, I want you to know the Spirit, God himself, Christ himself, helps you in your weaknesses. Because we don't know how to pray as we should many times. You know, many times we, we look at that and we say, well, sure, I know how to pray. Father, we thank you for this food. I'm in. Sure, I know how to pray. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul will keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul will take. Amen. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. By his hands we are fed. Give us, Lord, our daily bread. Amen. We're not to pray. I'm talking about prayer here. I'm not talking about something you memorize. I'm not talking about something you, you say rotely or poetically. I'm talking about intimacy. See, Paul is talking about something here that is far beyond just a rote prayer. Paul is talking about something here that's even beyond just a standing and praying to a pastoral prayer or, or leading in, a, in an offertory prayer or praying a benediction or whatever you might say. Paul is talking about something here that is so, so intimate. That you're hurting. And you don't know what to say. Paul says, pray anyway. Pray because we're supposed to pray. Scripture makes that clear. That's one of the things Paul is implying here. He doesn't explicitly say it, perhaps, but he says, listen, we're supposed to pray. He said to the Thessalonian Christians in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, pray without ceasing, pray continually. It's not just when you bow down. It's not just when you come to church. It's it's when you drive in your car with your eyes open, you pray. It's a matter of recognizing the presence of your Father in good times and bad times, in, in easy times and in hard times. It's recognizing that He is there. But I would also say that there are many times in our prayer life that Paul is saying, don't expect prayer to be easy. 
Don't expect it to be easy. We don't know how to pray. Well, why should it not be? Is there anything in the Christian life that is easy? Is holiness easy? Is evangelism easy? Are missions easy? No. They require sacrifice. They require, they require labor. They, they require us trusting Him, but then going at it. I mean, it's the same way, this whole thing with Planned Parenthood. You know, I, I had a friend of mine whom I love dearly. He graduated high school with me. He has cerebral palsy. He's my age, 64 years old. And he challenged me on one of my posts. He said, hey, just relax. God's in control. Yes, God is in control. I don't doubt that for one second. But God didn't say, hey, I'm in control. You just sit back and watch. He said, I'm in control, and I've called you to be salt and light. I've called you to speak truth to, to a, a world that's shrouded in darkness and, and falsehood. You be light. You be salt. You speak truth. So we ought to expect that the prayer is going to be difficult somewhat, never easy, because there's nothing in this life that is, in the Christian life. But Paul also implies here that we need to realize what you're doing when you pray. You're not talking to yourself. You're not talking to the person, if you're praying out loud in a group, you're not talking to the person next to you. You're not, you're not trying to impress them with how pious you can be, how religious you can sound, how holy you can formulate your voice. You're not talking to them. You're not talking to yourself. You're not talking to the ceiling. You're talking. You're addressing. We are addressing ourselves to the great sovereign God of the universe. And in prayer, we're not just asking, but we're adoring. We, we, are, we are confessing. We are giving thanksgivings, and we are giving supplications. We're asking for things, yes, but those don't stand alone in prayer. Your prayer ought to begin with worship. That you ought to be able to do. If you don't, go to the Psalms. Many times in my prayer time in the morning, I turn to a psalm. Like Psalm 111. Oh, that's a great one. Praise the Lord, it starts out. You know what? We read it a while ago. You know, just just praise the Lord. I I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart in the company, the upright, and in the assembly. In other words, I'm going to praise Him in my my closet. I'm going to praise Him by myself. But I'm going to praise Him in, in the assembly of believers. Those who are walking with Him. Man, start out by praying Psalm 111. If you don't know what to pray, just, just go to the Lord. You say, well, Bill, I thought you said don't, you, you don't, we're not talking about rote prayers. I'm not talking about rote prayers either. I'm talking about going to the inspired word of God and saying, God, let me make this my prayer to you today and start it out with worship and then see where it goes. Realize you're addressing a holy, sovereign, mighty, gracious God. And I would say be encouraged by these verses. You know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's an encouragement Paul has given us. If we are in Christ, we don't have to be on top of it. We, we don't have to have everything all together. You know, some people, some people think when you come to church, man, you got to at least look like you got it all together. You ever, you ever been that way? You ever know anybody like that? You know, man, I'm hurting. Family's falling apart. My kids are in rebellion. Just lost my job. Don't have any money in the bank. Don't know how I'm going to pay my house payment or my bills. I, you know, and so, so we, we come to church and say, okay, whew, but I can't let anybody know that. No. Paul said, listen, be encouraged in the midst of struggles. You may not know how to pray. You, you may not know how to present yourself, but listen, the Spirit knows what you need, and He's interceding on your behalf even when you don't know how to pray. Talk to you about the Spirit groaning. I love that because it says the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Now, 
Some commentators say, well, those groanings relate back to our groanings, and they're, they're, they're the groanings of, of our inability to express it, and that may very well be part of it. But it says here, if I read the text clearly, that the Spirit Himself intercedes with us, for us, with groanings. Now, let me tell you, the Spirit's not groaning because He doesn't know what to say. The Spirit's not groaning because He said, well, Father, I... I Bill down here is in a mess, and I just don't know, I don't know how to help him. It's not what it's saying. It's the groaning of, of someone who is bearing the burden with you. The Holy Spirit's bearing the burden with you. You know, if I were to say to three or four of you, y'all, y'all come up here a minute. We need to move this piano off the platform to the floor. Most of you would say, not me. (laughs) Not if you're in charge of it. We're not going to do it. But if we did, I imagine as we lifted that and bore that together, we would groan a bit. Not because we don't know what to say or what to do. We know what to do. You pick it up and you got to put it down. But we're bearing that burden together and we're groaning because of it. And we're probably saying, "Let's, let's call a professional mover to come move it down to there. The Holy Spirit bears our burdens with us. That's a part of being the paraclete, part of being the helper, the comforter that Jesus talked about in John 14, John 16, when he said, listen, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm not going to leave you by yourselves. I'm not going to leave you to face this dark and dying world that's going to hate you and you're going to suffer because of it. I'm not going to leave you alone in it. I'm going to go back to my Father and I'm going to send to you a, a comforter an encourager, a helper who will bear your burden with you and and be there with you. So be encouraged by these verses. Be encouraged by what the apostle is saying here in, in these things. The Holy Spirit is there, and with his help, we will make progress. With his help, we will grow. With his help, we will see maturity. With his help, we will see some, some movement in our prayer life and movement in our Christian life. Several other things I want you to see in this passage, these two simple verses. You know, we need to understand clearly that Paul is again showing us here that the Christian life is not getting saved and then doing the very best you can. It's not coming to Christ and and God saying, okay, now I've saved you, now (laughs) I hope you can do okay. No, he's saying from beginning to end, the Christian life is God's power made perfect in our weaknesses. And it's not just people like Jace, my friend, and, and his wife, Jacqueline, and it's not just people like you who are struggling here. Go to the Scripture. You'll find a lot of situations where saints of God in the Scriptures found themselves in very precarious situations. My, one of my favorite characters in the Old Testament is Elijah. You remember Elijah? Went up on Mount Carmel, slew the prophets of Baal, won the victory of the battle of the gods on Mount Carmel, saw God show his power, and all that took place. And and then Jezebel says, "Uh oh, he's killed all my prophets of Baal. I'm going to get him tonight. And if he's not in the same way that those prophets are by sundown, I'm going to do it. And what did Elijah say? He just saw saw 500, I believe it was 500 prophets of Baal slain. He he said, well, Jezebel, who are you? I'll stand again. No, he said, I'm going to run. And he got, and he ran, and he ran, and he hid under a, a tree. And he said, Lord, uh, Lord, I'm the only one that loves you. I want you to just take my life right now. You think he knew how to pray? He didn't know how to pray. The Apostle Paul. He had that thorn in the flesh. And we can debate all day what that thorn in the flesh was. I'd probably go around, and we got 350 people in here. We'd probably have 350 different opinions. That's all right, because the Holy Spirit didn't tell us. Scripture didn't tell us what the thorn was. It just said it was real. And Paul said, listen, I, I asked God three times. I went to the Father three times. I said, Lord, take it away. Take it away. Please take it away. And, and by the way, I think three is there as a symbolic number, not as an actual number. I don't think he just went three times and said, okay, uh, I'll quit praying. I think he begged God to take it away. God didn't take it away. He said, no, 
I'm going to leave that as a reminder to you that in your weakness, I am, my strength is demonstrated. Paul said several times, you know, though I'm weak, he's strong. When I'm weak, he is strong. In the midst of my weaknesses, he shows his strength. So understand, the Christian life is not just getting saved and then doing the best you can. We never graduate out of weaknesses, even in prayer. We never come to a point where our prayer life is just perfect. We don't need his help. Secondly, don't, don't expect God to wait until you have enough understanding before he stretches you. Don't expect him to wait until you are an absolutely mature believer, which none of us in this room, especially not this pastor, will ever, will ever be in this life a perfectly mature believer. But don't wait till don't 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 think God's going to wait until you've got really enough understanding of all this before He tests you in this. No. He wants you to see right now, today, that in your weakness, in your weakness. He's sufficient. In your suffering, He is sufficient. His presence is sufficient. Don't worry about finding the right words to pray that will be meaningful to God. Just find in your heart the longing to cry out to Him, to cry out, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to get through this. I don't, I don't know how my strength can get me through this because it can't. But I believe that yours can. Understand what Paul is saying here is your father knows you. And he not only knows you, but he understands you. And we don't even understand ourselves. He says the spirit... The Spirit searches the hearts and knows the mind. He knows you. He knows the Father. He knows what the will of God is. So He's interceding on your behalf, in your weakness, praying for you to know and to live in accordance with God's will. He's interceding in that way for you. And we don't understand ourselves, much less one another. In the afflictions that we find ourselves in, the sufferings we find ourselves in, but he understands it perfectly. Finally, you know, it's amazing here that Paul not one time said, and, and what the Spirit will do is he'll go to the Father and he'll try to change the Father's mind about your circumstances. I had Ricky read the Philippian prayer out of Philippians 1 as our scripture reading today. And I want you to hear that. I could have chosen Ephesians or Colossians or Thessalonians or any number of prayers. There's a prayer of Paul in every one of those. And you need to study those prayers of Paul because you need to realize when Paul prays for the people at Philippi or, or wherever he's praying for them, he never says, and Father, change their circumstances, take away their their." suffering, take away the struggles they're going through. He never prays for that. But he does pray, Father, show them yourself in the middle of it. So our prayer is not to be about trying to change God's mind, as though we know better than him. You ever been there? Now, God, if you could see life from my perspective, you'd understand this is how it ought to be. Later on in the same book, he's going to say, who are we to give God counsel? I mean, are we so wise that we can tell God what ought to be? We don't understand those things. He does. So prayer is not so much about changing God's mind. Prayer is our brokenness and our longing for nothing but His glory and His will in our lives. You've heard the, the old, st- old, old statement, prayer changes things. Don't you know that's true? Prayer does change things. But most importantly, it changes people. Genuine prayer 
crying out to the Father, recognizing your needs in His presence, recognizing your weakness in His strength, and crying out to Him even when you don't know what to say, even when the Spirit is having to intercede on your behalf, but just being in His presence, calling out to Him, crying out, Abba, Father, changes you. And that changes the way you see things. It makes them different. See, our God is a mighty God. Our God is an all-knowing God. Our God is an omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, and on and on and on. He is eternal. And He's the one we get to go to. <laughs> Let that sink in, folks. We, we don't go to a saint. We don't go to some intermediary that will pass the word along and hopefully it'll get to God eventually. We go into his presence by the only mediator, and that is his son, Jesus Christ. He is our only mediator. And he mediated for us on the cross to give us access into the presence of our Father. As a believer, how would we not use it? We got a new little baby in our church, Heather and Mark Rooks, after three very active boys, have a little girl. It's going to be fun to watch. I, I was by there, right on by yesterday again to see them and, and saw the baby, and she was beautiful as all babies are. And she cried. I mean, really loud for a day old baby. And it was just amazing to, to watch her. And, and, I, and Heather, I said something about it. I said, oh, she's got good lungs. Heather said, oh, she came out of the womb crying, screaming, breathing. <laughs> That's just what babies do. When they are born, when they exit the womb and enter this world, first thing they do is they breathe, and then the second thing they do is they usually... Make some racket. It's really not a whole lot different for we who are born again, is it? When we come out of the old life through the grace of God, by the power of Christ, into the new life, we breathe. And then we cry, Abba, Father. We pray. We, prayer is just like breathing for the baby. Prayer is like is our breath. It's our life breath. And Paul says, understand, it'll be a struggle. Understand, you don't have to do it perfectly. But understand, if you are a child of God, adopted in the family of God, prayer will be a vital part of your life. When things are tough, It'll make you pray more. I'm convinced that's why God allows things to come into our life because when things are going our way, we just kind of float. Mm, doing this all pretty good myself. Difficulty comes and we immediately go to Him. And that's normal and that's right and that's good. And that's what He wants from His children every day. Abba. Father, Abba, Father, I got this situation, I don't know how to pray, I don't know what to say, I'm hurting, Lord, I'm a little angry, Lord, I'm struggling, Lord, it's all right, I understand you, and I'm in this with you. I'm your Father, and I'm your Lord, and I'm your Helper. I'm with you. Even more than that, I'm praying for you. I'm your Advocate. I'm fighting for you. Because the Christian life, and the prayer life, is tough sometimes. 
but he never leaves us alone. Ever. Can we pray together? Holy Father, we bow before you, acknowledging that in prayer as in life, you're with us, you're for us, you're helping us, you're our strength and you're our salvation, and we need you. Father, I pray for men and women in this room right now who don't know you. Who've never believed in their hearts that God raised you from the dead. Who've never confessed with their mouth that Jesus is Lord. I would pray that today, Lord, would be that day in their life. That they would be birthed, rebirthed, to cry out, Abba, Father. And to say, Jesus is Lord. Father, I pray you would work by your Holy Spirit in their lives to do your work. And Father, I pray for others who maybe are just kind of in that backslidden condition. They they don't know how to pray, so they just don't pray. Lord, what what a tragedy. When you say, come to you, you'll help us. Even when we don't know how to pray. Father, teach us to pray and teach us to pray fully and groan in your presence if we have to. Mumble when we don't know what to say. The Lord cry out to you. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' holy, holy name. Amen.